I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett, and I hope this week has been good to you. Welcome to Local Matters. Let's talk about what's happening in our area. The South Shore Children's Museum's popular Trunk or Treat event is back. Start your little one's Halloween season off on Sunday, October 3rd, from 1 to 4 p.m. at 334 Old Oak Street in Pembroke. The North River Community Church parking lot will be transformed with first come, first serve pony rides, 12 stations to trick or treat at, pumpkin carving, a hayride, and more. Visit the South Shore Children's Museum Facebook page for more information. Gray's Beach Park in Kingston is the setting for a live music fall fest fundraiser brought to you by the Kingston Recreation Department and Waterfront Committee. Come out on September 26th from 1 to 6 to enjoy music from The Angry Bees, Rippers Incorporated, and That 80s Band. There will be vendors on site and, of course, food and drink. Proceeds from this event will go to support future community music events at Gray's Beach Park. Children are free. To learn more, visit the website at kingstonrec.com. South Shore Conservatory, with campuses in Hingham and Duxbury, is now the largest community school for the arts in Massachusetts and among the top 20 in the country. Christy Faby is SSC's new Director of Creative Arts Therapies, and Julie Thompson invited Christy on to talk about her vision for this program, which provides music, dance, and yoga therapy to some of the most vulnerable children and adults in our community. Thank you, Christy, for being here today. It's so wonderful to have you. Can you tell me a little bit about the Creative Arts Therapies program at the conservatory and how you got to be uh, running it? Sure. So the Creative Arts Therapies program at the conservatory lives out our mission of making the arts accessible to all in the South Shore community. So we have music therapy, dance therapy, and yoga for the special child and other adaptive yoga programs. Um, creative Arts Therapies is the therapeutic use of music, dance, art, whatever modality uh, you could think of, drama, in order to reach a therapeutic goal. So with music therapy, for instance, we're not teaching a music lesson. The end goal is not to learn piano. The end goal might be to play piano in order to increase the use of your fine motor skills. Um, I ended up in this position in kind of a roundabout way. So I initially went to Florida State University to study uh, psychology and international relations. And after I graduated, all my professors told me to go to law school. So I actually went to law school for a year, finished my 1L, had a fellowship at um, a civil rights firm worked a bit with uh, female inmates in the federal prison system, really liked working with them, didn't really like the legal aspects of it. So I actually did some career tests and everything led back to social worker, recreation therapist, music therapist. Um, so I ended up in a master's degree program instead in music therapy and I love it. I ended up in Boston at Perkins School for the Blind for my internship and I've spent the past four years uh, working in long-term care facilities as a music therapist then building an expressive therapies program with um, art therapy and then as a memory care director wasn't really looking to go anywhere but then this fabulous position opened up at south shore conservatory and i could not say no so here i am today wow what a varied background that has brought you here which is it must feed into um hugely helping with curriculum development and and to assess each of your students now you said uh, you kind of do individualized well, do you do individualized uh, programs or uh, curriculum for each student and then work them into classes or are they basically is everybody individualized? Yeah, so music therapy, dance therapy and yoga are kind of different than um, a traditional class or a lesson. So we actually meet the child wherever they are, whether it's in and we work with older adults too. We work with young adults, all different ages. We meet our clients wherever they are, if it's in the home, if it's in the community, if it's on campus, in a long-term care facility, et cetera. Um, and we meet them where they are in every sense of the word. So everything's individualized. Um, 
you know, if a child is working on some pre-verbal skills, we'll use uh, music and we'll use choice making with instruments to help with pointing, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, if we have an older adult with Alzheimer's who is really um, sleepy and tired, uh, we could use music to promote stimulation with them. We could use music to help recall memories with them and kind of maintain where they are. Uh, so it's very individualized. Um, we do have some classes, like we have a class for children with developmental delays, that's music and dance therapy, but we keep our, our groups small mm -hmm. so that we can target each individual and where they are. And do you, do you have long-term plans for, for, these, for your students, whether they're, they're little kids or they're older adults? Um, do you, you kind of follow them and have kind of a, a versus a short-term strategy, it seems to me like this is almost a lifelong process. Is that accurate? Yeah, so it can be either or, again, meeting the client where they are. So if somebody um, has some pain management issues and they're not feeling well, we could use music to help with that or yoga and mindfulness to help with that. And then if they're feeling better, that might be more of a short term goal, right? Like just to help stop the nausea or just to feel better or be able to go to sleep. Um, mm -hmm. As therapists, we could help with that. But we often, like you said, Julie, see uh, clients more long term. Mm -hmm. So we might follow a client for years and it's really sweet because a lot of our therapists are there while our little ones are growing up. Um, a lot of our clients seeing in our group community voices and then we may see them one-on-one. -on -one. So it's these really deep bonds that form that is really lovely. Now, so if I heard you right, the, your clients or the children or the adults or whoever is, is going to take advantage of these programs doesn't necessarily have to come to your facilities? Or do they? Exactly. Or they don't, okay. Yeah, exactly. So as part of my role, I actually see a few clients on my own. And I travel to Randolph and Canton and Abington. Um, I'll be working in the Braintree Public Schools at the beginning of fall. So as you can see, we're everywhere, um, which is really lovely and makes our services really accessible. If you can't access transportation, no problem. We can come to you. We want to make sure everyone who needs us can get us. Wow, that's amazing. And a question that comes to mind that I asked you a little bit before we went on air was um, for, for students over this past year who've really had to struggle with the, the, you know, the Zooming for school and online learning. And I know there's an awful lot of kids that need some kind of therapeutic work. And there's very yes. few therapists available. Do you see an influx in that type of service and have you adjusted to create new programs for that specific need? Sure, so um, our individual programs would be um, lovely for children who have experienced isolation or Zoom fatigue or any type of um, sort of wellness, mental health distress during this pandemic. You know, our dance therapist has actually done a lot of presentations around campus about trauma-informed care and actually educating our faculty so that they know that every child who walks through our doors has probably experienced some type of trauma during the pandemic, and we have collective trauma. Um, so here's where we need to be sensitive. And with our therapist in particular, you know, music, dance, yoga, they're so accessible. Um, if you have a child in need of therapy, it's different than traditional talk therapy because mm. they can come in and they can make music and they can experience joy and connect with a therapist right away. And so it's a really great tool to work on mental wellness. Um, as with people who um, have Alzheimer's or dementia and have been isolated or any older adult, we have our memory cafes for them. And we really work on just a lot of like promoting joy and positive socialization. Wow, it's, it's pretty amazing all the things that you are offering to, to so many. It's, you know, 
it's it's kind of the cradle to the crypt <laughs> type of thing. You're, you, right, you, exactly. You, you follow everywhere. And one of my last questions is, do you do any of this online? Do you do any like this if you can't get with the mm -hmm. children? Because uh, they can play instruments with you and they can do dance moves with you. Do you do any of that? Yes, we certainly do. So we had to adapt and we transferred uh, our memory cafes. One of our memory cafes is in person on our Duxbury campus every other Tuesday. Another memory cafe is still offered virtually on a Thursday because we found that for some older adults, um, that is the most accessible way. So we're keeping that going. Um, we also have one therapist who's been seeing one of her early interventions, so that's zero to three um, clients with a developmental delay via Zoom, and I've seen it in action. It's really lovely. The client will sit in uh, their mother's lap and play right along on the screen with Amanda, and we've shifted uh, our community voices plural opportunities in a hybrid model. So you can come onto campus, space is limited due to the pandemic mm -hmm. and we want a social distance and we want a mask. Um, but we also can zoom you in if you feel more comfortable that way. So we do offer the hybrid approach. Wow, a little bit of everything for a little bit of everybody. Exactly. Um, well, yes. thank you so much. Uh, we, we would encourage people to obviously go to your website to see everything that you offer, not only in this, but the conservatory offers so much anyway. Thank you so much for joining us today and best of luck to you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thanks, Julie and Christy. To learn more about South Shore Conservatory's Creative Arts Therapies Program and all of the other wonderful programs offered by SSC, visit their website at sscmusic.org. With a show that is at times funny, at times poignant, but always entertaining, musician and vocalist David Polanski returns to the Plymouth Public Library on September 29th at 7 p.m. as part of its Irish music series. For an entire Celtic hour, David will perform heartfelt renditions of the Irish tunes and melodies that are classics and beloved all over the world. Visit the Plymouth Public Library website to register. Shagley is a youth-led, adult-supported organization committed to social support and the creation of a safe haven for LGBTQ plus youth ages 13 to 22. Shagley meetings are once again in person, and you can find them at the First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church in Duxbury every second and fourth Monday of the month from 7 to 9 p.m. Shagley meetings are open to all LGBTQ plus middle and high schoolers and allies aged 12 to 18. To learn more, visit the Shagley Facebook page. A story walk brings two of the best elements for the human mind together, reading and the outdoors. Open to the public since August, the Duxbury Free Library Story Walk is permanently installed in the outdoor classroom behind the Alden School. Local seniors Erica and Max visited the Story Walk, welcomed by librarian Megan Yost. I'm here with Megan Yost, and she is the young adult librarian at the Duxbury Free Library. We are here at the Christine Devine Rainbow Memorial Story Walk behind Alden Elementary School. Megan, can you tell us about the Story Walk? Yes. The Story Walk is where we take a picture book and we uh, tear the picture book apart, technically, <laughs> and we post it outdoors. Um, in our plaques so that lots of people can come out and enjoy these storybooks um, on their own or with their family, late at night, in the middle of the day, doesn't matter. Um, and then you can engage and converse as long as you want um, about the story that you're reading. So how did this story walk start? What was the driving force behind it? Uh, so it was the middle of the pandemic and we were shut down and we wanted to be able to engage with um, our, our community still especially our younger kids who were all trapped inside and staring at computers all day long. So we um, applied for a Grafton grant. The, the Grafton uh, grant is really great. They help us out almost every year with things. So this year we thought it would be great for the story walk. And Christine Devine um, unfortunately passed away, but she was an early educator and her family decided to donate money. And we thought it would be really great to combine her love 
of stories and teaching children with the story walk. So um, her funds with the Grafton really uh, helped us be able to get all of the posts and all of the outdoor stuff so that it could really last and stand the test of time for us and continue to purchase stories to put in it. That's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that something had come out of something so traumatic, yes. but everybody can actually enjoy and go for the walk and go do it. And yep. speaking of which, can we go on that walk Definitely, right now? Definitely, let's. <laughs> So tell us about your background and your inspiration to study library science. My undergraduate degree is actually in theater production and I did props in theater for about four years. Um, I um, have always loved the library. We, I grew up always going to the library. Um, and so I just decided to kind of take my skills of theater and making things and um, do children's and youth services in libraries. I've been working in libraries since 2013. I always loved living in this area when, when I was in school and um, my husband really liked the area when he came up and visited me and stuff. So um, this job came up and it was kind of perfect. Uh, I can work with just the teens now. I used to work with the full range birth to 18, but I control the ordering and the programming and, um, and everything for, for the young adults division. So um, it's, been, it's been a really great job and, and I love that I came here. It's a great, great library and a great staff to work with. <laughs> now why the children's division and not the adults? Um, children are pure. <laughs> um, they're just, they're so much better to work with. You get such joy from them and it can be what seems like the littlest thing to you, such as walking through the woods and reading a story or singing a song 12 times in a row to them. They just, they light up and they love it. And you know, teens, Teens are the adults. If you don't get them in that in that age range, you know, you can lose them. And then, you know, these are these are the future. These are the people that become senators and become lawyers and doctors and really affect the way the world changes. Um, so I think it's important to try and help them grow and have a safe and open place to come um, and explore who they are. Um, so I like I like working with the kids better than adults. <laughs> nothing wrong with adults. But <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing wrong with that. Um, so with you working at the Free Library, what kind of events can we expect to start showing up in the near future? Uh, so fall, we're really trying to amp programming kind of back up a little bit more. Uh, I'm gonna have a teen movie night, Wednesday nights at six o'clock, starting uh, September 1st. Uh, I have, um, I'm gonna do some, I uh, nailed it, like a, Give me your best creation of cake pop in October for like Halloween -y themed, spooky themed. Um, we're gonna have some outdoor movies going in October. I'm gonna air the, the movie The Public September 10th at seven o'clock um, outside on the side lawn for library card sign up month in September. Um, but we have our open book club coming all the time. Um, every, we have a new one going up this month. We have our stitch along that's Wednesday nights uh, that Elizabeth does that's really popular. It's embroidery and she teaches you how to do the stitches and you do project all month long um, every week. And that's really great. She still does it over Zoom. So she, you know, we send you the, the pattern and you can still do it from home. And it's a really great group. Um, that's been really popular even throughout the pandemic. So it's nice we can continue that going. And we have story time starting up in September again for the little ones. Uh, outside still on the lawn. Uh, Tuesdays at 11. So this wouldn't be an interview with a librarian without asking you, what are you reading right now and what would you recommend to readers out there? Um, a really great adult book is One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. Uh, she wrote Red, White and Royal Blue, which was really popular a few years ago. Um, she just does this really great like witty, funny, romances that aren't like dripping heavy romances and this one's nice because it has a cute little like supernatural kind of element but it's not like super heavy ghosts like 
you're not really into it, you would still very much enjoy this, this story. Um, I read The Firekeeper's Daughter, it's a really great YA one, um, by Angela, it starts with a B and I cannot remember her last name, um, but it's really great. It's about a, the Native American tribe in Michigan on the Canadian border, and they start to have this terrible um, meth and, uh, epidemic in their community and uh, she the main character gets hit very hard personally her best friend is killed and so she is determined to find out what's the root of this panda uh, epidemic and and where what's happening and um, help her community out and you learn great things about the Native American culture and things like that um, and a good kids series is always Magic Misfits by Neil Patrick Harris He's so funny, and there's this great group of misfit kids, you know, and they learn magic, and it's how they, they you know, explore their friendship, and there's four books in the series. Um, they all have different little elements of fun, and, and it's a very diverse uh, cast, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a fun series for, for anyone to read. <laughs> well, those are some awesome recommendations, and before we wrap this up, do you have any little bits of nugget information that you want to give out, anything that you didn't get a chance to say? Um, one thing I do love about our library is we have an unusual items collection, um, or kits, uh, you know, as we call them, and uh, I've really expanded that collection over the past year or so, and we're continuing to expand it, including I'm hoping to buy some more tools. Um, so you could check out a circular saw and you just have to buy the blade, and it can, you know, really help the community and saves a lot of money. In other library news, we move to the Pembroke Public Library, where we honor two decades of leadership. After 20 years as library director and 32 years as a librarian, Deborah Wall has decided to retire. The library and Pembroke community celebrated Deborah's accomplishments with an event of appreciation. Just a certificate of appreciation for you. I'm wondering if I could read it for you. This sure. is from the Select Board of Pembroke and the Town Manager's Office. In recognition, in recognition and sincere appreciation of your 20 years of dedication and faithful service to the Town of Pembroke, the Select Board and Town Manager offer help, heartfelt thanks and extends best wishes for many happy and healthy days ahead. We're going to so desperately miss you. <laughs> This is a certificate of commendation for Deborah Wong and appreciation for 20 years of exemplary dedication to the Commonwealth Libraries, most notably as director of the Pembroke Public Library. We hereby offer our most sincere thanks and appreciation for your leadership and service and our congratulations upon the occasion of your return. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all the passions that she shares and our varied interests. I don't know if you all know, but Deb was also named uh, one of the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Heroine Award. I forget what year that was. It was 2013. 2013. Unsung Heroine. Unsung Heroine. So her, her talents were recognized across the state in a ceremony up at the State House with Governor uh, Baker and so forth. So that was a, a, another one of your many talents. Um, they only allow us so much space to, to put things on here. So that's why I had to tell that because it wasn't okay. it didn't fit on here. Uh, but on behalf of, of Senator Sumeran and myself, um, this is a resolution that was passed by both branches of the, of the state legislature, and it's read into the record in both the House and the Senate, so this becomes a permanent part of the record cool. of the state legislature, which you know predates our U.S. Constitution, which is kind of cool. So I'm going to read it, uh, so bear with me a moment, and uh, I try not to embarrass it. Uh, <laughs> Too late. Too late. The Massachusetts General Court. Congratulating Deborah Wall on the occasion of her retirement as director of the Pembroke Public Library. Whereas, Deborah Wall will retire as director of the Pembroke Public Library after more than 20 years of service. And whereas, Ms. Wall was integral in every visitor's positive experience of the Pembroke Public Library and supported, cultivated, and expanded the Pembroke Public Library and its programs in numerous ways, including by planning and coordinating activities to foster an affinity for reading among the town's youths, and introducing unique solutions and technologies to remain at the forefront of innovation in library services. And, whereas, during her time as director of the Pembroke Public Library, Ms. Wall organized many town-wide events, including the town of Pembroke's 
300th anniversary, I remember all that, good times, oh, yes. and continue your work throughout the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic, not its fun times, mm -hmm. ensuring residents could safely access the library's resources through her implementation of, of curbside pickups. I'm gonna just pause here and mention one other thing, I apologize. Deb was really instrumental in making sure we got extra funds through the County Cares and the Federal Cares Program along with the cooperation of our library uh, trustees and our select uh, board of selectmen in, in, in town to get extra funds to expand those library services during COVID. I know because she, she worked with us on that. So really it was her initiative, her drive to get those funds, make sure residents were getting their services even during COVID-19. So I don't know if everyone's aware of that, but you really should be should be aware of that all the, the great work that she did. So I'm sorry, back to the resolution. Whereas this wall has maximized the potential of the Pembroke Public Library expanding its services by making it a passport acceptance facility. I actually didn't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm learning too. And an emergency shelter, I didn't know that. And spearheading numerous grant opportunities for its continued growth, including most recently two customer service grants, a preservation survey grant, and the next chapter grant. That's great. Therefore, be it resolved that the Massachusetts General Court hereby congratulates Deborah Wall on the occasion of her retirement as director of the Pembroke Public Library and further extends to her its best wishes and appreciation for her dedicated service to the people of the town of Pembroke. And be it further resolved that a copy of these resolutions shall be forwarded by the clerk of the House of Representatives to Deborah Wall, my job here today, uh, signed, so it's House of Representatives adopted August 26, 2021, signed by Ronald A. Mariano, Speaker of the House, Stephen T. James, the Clerk of the House, and then adopted in the Senate in concurrence on August 26, 2021 by Karen E. Spilka, President of the Senate, and offered by Representative Josh Cutler and Senator Sue Moran. So on behalf of all of us on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we congratulate you on a job well done. Thank you all for coming. One thing people keep asking me is, um, oh, you must be so happy to retire. I am, you know, I am. I, I'm looking forward to the rest, but I have loved this job. I love this library. I love the people who work here and all the people who've worked here for all the years, and I love the community. So it's been a gift to work here, and um, I've enjoyed most of it, you know, it's so hard to say. The last year and a half was really hard. Can we just skip that part? But um, and I've been a library. I've been a librarian for 32 years. We 32 years in December. So yeah, I've been doing this a long time. But um, yeah, I'm happy with my tenure here. It's been great. And I know, I know, the staff will only do great and wonderful things in the future. Many car buyers concerned about the environment are considering electric cars, and the Plymouth Public Library teamed up with the New England Electric Auto Association for an educational and entertaining event on September 25th from 1 to 3 p.m. Several dealers and actual electric car owners will be in the library's parking lot to offer test drives with the latest hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and pure electric vehicles. If you're interested in the technology, this is a great opportunity to test out an electric vehicle without the typical dealership setting of possibly being pressured to buy. Light refreshments will be served and a solar installer will also be present. For more information, please call Jesse at 857-344-6209. From seed to harvest, green energy to green living, your green space features ways you can keep your garden, home, and body feeling green. In this episode, Erica returns to Maribet Farm for part two on blueberries. Now, it's time for the harvest. We have come to a complete rotation in this circle of life. Last time we were here at Maribet Farms, it was spring and these bushes were freshly green. Now, a few months later, they're full with blueberries. There's no great secret to picking these delicious berries, and there isn't an easier fruit to prepare or serve. You don't need to peel, pit, core, or cut. Plus they freeze, can, or dry for long-term storage. If you don't make short work of them into a pie, cobbler, or even just a snack. Come take a walk with me while Ron Maribet takes us through this patch one more time.
Hi everybody, this is uh, Ron Maribet again here at the Maribet Farm and uh, this is the third in a series uh, which you can find on YouTube either through the MaribetFarm.com Facebook page or through PAC TV in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Uh, today we're going to talk about the harvest and we're going to begin by talking about the infrastructure we use to net the blueberries to keep the birds off without using uh, measure all. This is an organic operation. You'll notice that we have this Sissel blueberry netting. It's pretty resilient. We do need to do some replacement, but it's good strong. It's one inch openings, usually small enough to prevent 90% of the birds from coming through there. You'll see down here we have chicken wire. It's the same opening size. And the reason for the chicken wire here is permaculture. So we also raise organic meat birds. We like to allow them some forage. So as soon as the harvest is over, set up a little housing arrangement for them and we'll let them out to forage among the blueberry plants and eat up things like poison ivy and dropped berries that might be uh, affected with pests and things like that. So it's, it's cleaning up after the harvest and providing good nutrients for people to buy when they're buying organic meat. We've come up with a new approach this year. It's a mailbox stake that we drive into the ground, so it will last a much longer time, so we'll put much less stress on forestry products to suspend our netting. Maybe at some point we can replace this with a durable composite or maybe PVC or something like that, but we're always considering the ecological implications of materials. In the off-season, we're going to take these down and um, seal them up and spray paint them to further protect them, but we want to let them open, let the pores open up during the warm season here so that it can accommodate the paints that we use to make them stronger. We put these recycled plastic bottles and we cover the top to prevent water from standing on the top of the wood so that it will, you know, rot it out. And so it serves a dual purpose of recycling plastics, getting them out of the waste stream and protecting the wood for longevity. Here's one of the ways we fasten the fence, the uh, netting to the fencing. We used um, recycled baling twine, which we get when we buy um, salt marsh hay, the seedless mulch comes in these, so we can recycle those and use them to tie off. Another way we fasten them is with fine metal wire. Both of these will last forever because that's plastic and this is metal. We suspend the netting on number 12 wire that goes along the tops and cuts across strategically. You can see we mow the aisles in the blueberry patch to make it clean and safe. You can see how this protects the blueberries. Of course, they're much better protected in the inside because birds can land on this and peck their way through. But since birds are famous for making nests, they're good at weaving and so they're good at unweaving. Ultimately, you, when you have too many holes, you have to replace it because they'll figure out how to get in even though you might have patched something. See this right here? Uh -huh. So when you see a bird and they go out, uh -huh. you go to that place immediately because that's where they came in and where they'll go out. If you can just give me a little piece of wire and I'll patch this one temporarily but right there and get it through, okay? And this one, this needs a little more attention too, okay? Okay. But we're good for now and you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is 100 feet by 30 feet. It's one of four of these netting infrastructures that we will have up by this time next year. And so we've been building this up and getting, and now they're getting back to a point where they're starting to yield again, and we'll have three different sections next year, and then we're gonna do permaculture plantings, variations of different plants, you know, in between these patches. So it'll be a variegated orchard. Probably gonna put a little coop right here and match the netting around to it. The other reason for leaving the netting up while the birds are in here is for hawk pr protection and other predators, so that uh, during the day, uh, you can have a hawk presence, but they won't try to fly through netting. If they do, they'll get caught in it and it will be fatal. They have the greatest eyes, those hawks. They know what they're doing. What we'll do is put a little shed here, maybe on wheels, and uh, make an opening 
and secure this all the way around it and then we can have a back door to feed them and a front a way to get into the front through a gate we're going to put here to close them in at night because the raccoons the other predators they don't mind using the netting for a trampoline and finding an opening or making one we're in a wildlife corridor here of about 200 acres between Sampson Park here in Kingston and the town well site on the north of Elm Street. And then on the other side is the Southeastern Massachusetts Wildlands Trust. So this has become a wildlife corridor. We see a lot of deer, we see skunks, all kinds of critters out here if you come out at night. And uh, so we have to protect the birds from that. And we have to protect the blueberries from the daytime predators. This is pretty much the operation where we're prepared to harvest. Lessons learned from harvesting many, many years. We actually got here in 1986. And we've been harvesting blueberries more or less ever since. This is a pint container, holds one pound of blueberries. So we have this expression we use in the biz, a pint's a pound the world around. So we use this for people who, we ask people to bring their own recycled containers to take the blueberries away because we can save on the cost of these. These are about 10 cents a piece, so, and of course they're manufactured and there's all of that energy use. As an alternative to having a, a scale in the field, we just fill one of these up and we'll show you that when they come back with a batch of blueberries. So I have two pickers here. This is Jenilyn Warkup. You've met her in a previous video. She's involved with the weather station over here to monitor climate implications for agriculture with Dr. Hellstrom at Bridgewater State University. And this is uh, Clara Bowman. And she's a Duxbury resident, but also a student in communication at uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. And she's been an intern of sorts here this summer as well, helping out with the infrastructure and with picking. Uh, she's a great picker. We're gonna try to do a little production. Like Brown was saying, we just set up all this netting over the past few days. And so this is our entrance over here. And so now this helps protect this from the birds. And so all these ripe ones, the birds will love. So now we have it a little bit protected in here. And then the easier they fall off the stem, the riper and the sweeter they are also. And since we're harvesting to sell to farm stands and things, that's definitely what you wanna look out for is have them be as ripe as possible. And something I like to do to help is like, sometimes I get under and if you look above, there's so many under the leaves that you would never see from other angles. And so I like to kind of get the bush from a lot of different angles as you're doing it. And you find a lot more that you wouldn't see otherwise. So what if you were to pick one that wasn't necessarily ready, but it just... Yeah, like totally ripe yet. Yeah, so what we do with that, and so this is just the first step in kind of a process to process the blueberries. And so you'll pick, and of course, like you'll get some that you won't realize we'll have, like I'll show, try to show you. Some of them have white spots, some aren't quite ready. And so once we bring them up to the barn, we lay them all out and then we take them through our hands and we kind of sort through like which ones have maybe blemishes, which ones aren't ripe yet. And then we put those in a different bucket. And a lot of times those can be used for baking or cooking because it doesn't matter as much. Um, so we, we do live, really use like every blueberry that we pick, which is pretty cool. Before when you guys were kind of patching everything up, you guys were talking about PI. Mm. When you're picking blueberries, what do you have to be concerned about? Yeah, poison ivy is definitely, definitely a big thing. You do have to be, it, it's cool because it brings you into the process fully because you do have to be really mindful of where you're about to reach your hand, like where you're about to step into because poison ivy does like to trail right up the bushes and so it's all over the place. Sometimes you'll find little bugs and stuff to watch out for and you flick them off or keep an eye out for like if there's like a bunch of caterpillars, you'll avoid that. Oh yeah, so this bush has poison ivy vines all coming. That's actually like all oh, poison ivy, that's kind of crazy. So this is what most people know when it looks like when it's young. It has the reddish leaves, the really oily young leaves. And so this whole thing is poison ivy. And even in the winter when it's dead, the stems are still, you can get the oils from it and still get a poison ivy rash. So definitely this is a bush that we wouldn't pick too much. And then you just really have to be mindful of like what are the different plants going on in here. Like there's some growing up down right there. 
So you just have to be mine. And most people probably know leaves of three, leave it be. And that's a good one that I like to remember because it's nice and easy. So you look for the leaves of three that come up and then when they're younger, they'll have that sheen and then when they're older, they're more matte and like a light green color. And they look totally different in all seasons. Like in the fall, their leaves turn red. So you watch out for a different color then. You just have to kind of know what it looks like in its different forms because it takes on a lot of different ones. It can be anywhere from like one to three days to kind of appear. So you never know if you're going to have it or not. But yeah, this appeared in one day and you have to wash it with a special kind of soap that gets the oils out and never use hot water because then the oils will spread and just go everywhere. So always cold water and always it's better to be more cautious and just wear long clothes, long pants, long shirts. And then probably another thing to be aware of also is it depends on the weather, but the sun is definitely something when you're out mm. here like working in fields and everything, I feel like it's really easy to get caught up and not think about the sun and how much it's actually beating down on you. So that's probably another thing. How long does it normally take you to get to a pint of blueberries as far as picking goes? Mm, it definitely it definitely varies a lot depending on how much the bushes are. I had started kind of doing it methodically, trying to go one bush at a time, and I found that that took a lot more time. I feel like it's better to kind of walk around and see where there's a bunch and then do that and then kind of go to the next bunch of them. And it probably takes, it'll probably take maybe like a good half an hour, 45 minutes to get around up to here. So it's definitely time consuming, but it goes quicker sometimes, it goes slower if you're being more methodical. And then sometimes there's ones that you pick and they're already kind of gone by, which we try to avoid and get them before that. But if there are some that are already gone by, we usually just leave them on the ground for whatever <laughs> wants to eat them. <laughs> so we're not wasting. A few of them definitely have a little bit of what Ron would call a red eye. So a lot of times you'll find one that have a blemish in this already, and a lot of times it's because either a bird packed it or a bug got into it and it will kind of leave. So you'll go to pick it and you won't realize until your finger goes right in it and it's mushy and <laughs> feels gross. And so usually we leave those on the ground also. What other creatures tend to get in here other than birds? Mm, we've definitely seen bunnies so far. A lot of bugs too, because bugs we can't really stop. And then another thing Ron always says when you're harvesting is you have to be careful to stay in the rows and not knock into the bushes and knock off a whole arm of the blueberry bush. So definitely in that sense being mindful also of where you are and what you're hitting up against. It's my first time picking them. It's very nice because I've pruned many of these the winter and some of the spring. It's something to be said about picking the fruits of your labor. And I'm a blueberry fanatic so very glad to have a stronger connection with my love. I mean, I'm very ready to take them home, see how they last, see what I can do with them. And make the most use because it's a little luxury. It's such a luxury to have this land and have all these plants, you know, now giving us fruit for us to pick. So do you think you have about a, a pint? Yeah. Alrighty. Oh yeah, I should probably transfer these now so they don't get mushy. Okay, and then we can pick these up, pick out more refuse, and the final cut in sorting is that we take one of these and we run them through our hands. See that? You can see each one. These are pretty good looking berries. I wonder who, oh, I picked these. Okay, had a little experience. All right, so that's that. Let's take some of Gentlin's. Since this is a small container and it kind of matches the pint, we don't have to uh, we don't have to pour it all off. We can do them one shot here. Ooh. So this right here is a red eye, not oh. ripe. So we'll throw those. We'll put all of those. We call them culls. We'll cull those out. And the thing about the red eye is it's a good berry for cooking because the red represents pectin which is a natural preservative. You want to put that in something that you're going to add sugar to anyway because yeah. it's very tart. Or you want to put that in a corn or blueberry muffin. So we cull off the red eyes. They're still highly nutritious and valuable fruit. When's the last time you picked, gentlemen? This is my first time. This is awesome. She's a star. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna, really, all right, really so good. She's got herself a, a close to two pints of really good blueberries with an occasional cull. So that's pretty much how we do that. We do that till it's level. Maybe throw a few more on afterwards. 
If you have a question, you can go on to maribetfarm.com on Facebook and post a question and we will give you answers. Uh, we'll get back to people if you have to like us. You know how to do that, I'm sure. And also, uh, we have an Instagram account, which has just been put in place. So uh, we're happy to answer questions and so on and so forth. Thank you. The longer they stay on the bush to fully ripen, the sweeter the berry becomes. Gently using your thumb, roll the berry off the stem and into your palm. Ideally, once the first berry is picked, you will place it in your bucket or basket and continue until you have harvested all the blueberries that you want. Once you are done harvesting the blueberries, you can use them immediately or freeze them for later use. However you decide to use them, you can rest assured their amazing nutritive properties are well worth the afternoon at the berry patch. Thanks, Erica. Next up, we have singer-songwriter Brian Sansies, who has been writing music and performing all over Cape Cod and New England for more than two decades. This is his original work.
Thank you, Brian. And thank you for staying with us for this episode of Local Matters. From all of us at PAC TV, have a happy and safe week. We will see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.